we think about a binary often between who's a founder and who's not a founder. The reality is that binary is only broken when you break it. And it doesn't really exist in the present either. Hi everyone, I'm here with Grant Gordon, a junior at Stanford studying sustainable business. He spent the last year at Sequoia Capital working on the company design program, Sequoia's early stage accelerator, and supporting founders on product, GTM, and strategy. He's the co-founder of College Ventures Network, mm. the largest network of student-run venture groups in the world. At Stanford, he's also co-MD of Cardinal Ventures, an early stage accelerator whose companies have raised over 400 million. It's a pleasure to be with you here today, Grant. How are you doing? Wonderful. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you for putting this on, Zara. It's been incredible. So let's jump right in. I'd love to hear more about Cardinal Ventures. You know, it's done some incredible mm. things so far. Maybe you can tell us about your role and a couple of the startups that have just stuck with you sure. that maybe have some incredible stories and make you feel optimistic about the future. <laughs> Absolutely. So for those of you that are devoted readers of Accelerated, like I am, which is actually how I got into the industry and first started hearing about startups and VC and all of those things. The founders of that newsletter, the Venture Twins, Justine and Olivia Moore, Olivia is now at Andreessen, Justine is at Canal. They founded Cardinal Ventures when they were students at Stanford as well. And if you think about the world we're in now in the venture landscape of Gen Z VCs, of this real conviction that somebody that's 19, 20, 21 years old can be writing checks and picking companies. And more importantly, not only doing it as access for funds down the line, but actually as kind of the investors themselves, that moment was not true five or six years ago, which speaks to the incredible efforts of frankly folks like Dina that have brought in, you know, Sajud and Rakul at Lux and other people. But in that moment five years ago, when students making investments and picking companies was foreign, Cardinal Ventures was a big first step. And so the idea was, even if we're not writing checks, we're gonna be a non-equity accelerator. We're going to be picking companies before the major VCs do and accelerating them through 10 weeks of curriculum to their first institutional funding. So modeled off of YC, we take folks that maybe have an MVP or come out of classes like Startup Garage or Lean Launchpad, these really famous venture incubation classes, and take them through to raising a pre-seed or seed round. And that sounds iffy. <laughs> I'm the first to admit letting 21 year olds and including some older folks that are MBAs or law students pick these companies and take them through funding rounds sounds questionable. But we did an analysis as of around six months ago, how those companies had done. And in five years of accelerating maybe 25, 30 companies each, especially in recent years, earlier it was fewer, our companies have raised $400 million in follow-on funding. We have our first unicorn as of this month, Mammoth Biosciences, and hopefully we'll have many more. So it's been an incredible journey to be on. And that journey started my sophomore year. I want to pick up at some point, and you can tell me when to get into it, but on how to really get into venture. As Dina was talking about, how do you add value? How do you find kind of your place in the world? But I started as a sophomore. My place was on the marketing team, trying to help companies figure out what we were doing. And Cardinal Ventures was in a big rut. You know, we were an organization that nobody really knew about. I only found out about it because I saw uh, a laptop sticker on the guy who was leaving the jobs computer. And I said, what the heck is that? And he said, why don't you take my job? I'm leaving it. And I said, great. So I only found out about it because of that. And our companies weren't doing too hot and our partners weren't that happy with us. But over the last two years, we've really changed that around such that of maybe 15 or so companies we bring through each cohort, seven of them are raising seed rounds by the end. And three of them are actually raising seed rounds before demo day, which is kind of insane numbers. If you think about it, a bunch of students around the table trying to pick companies and getting them to raise some serious money. So my journey at Cardinal Ventures has been an incredible amount of learning. And one of the things we did was start the College Ventures Network, which has been such an incredible part of my time in college and all the people I've gotten to meet. I would say a solid quarter of my tech friends are from the College Ventures Network. Wow, that's really amazing. I'd love to hear more about Mammoth Bioscience. So they were in our maybe first or second batch, which just speaks to how good the Venture Twins are. And what they do is they took science that was developed by Jennifer Dowden at Berkeley in CRISPR, where you can go in and surgically insert or delete certain genes from the genome and use it for diagnostics. And what this really speaks to also, he was a PhD student at the time. So imagine you have a bunch of undergrads advising a PhD student to raise money in a really hard <laughs> field with new technology. That sounds like a mess. And then they met Naveen Chada at Mayfield 
who participated in the seed led the A. And what they eventually developed is one of the foremost companies in cell and genome diagnostics in the world. And it just crossed over to unicorn status. And maybe there will be an IPO sometime soon. We would love to have Cardinal Ventures first IPO. That's incredible. And so I know you mentioned that there are PhDs, but you also have some undergrad founders as well. And actually, if you compare the US and the UK, it's very interesting to look at. If you look at entrepreneurships on campus, you see a lot more postgrad entrepreneurship in the UK Mm. compared to the undergrad entrepreneurship in the US. So I wanted to get your thoughts. What is it about the US ecosystem that really facilitates that? You know, I think they do a lot of things right. And particularly Stanford has some really amazing courses and events going on. But what is it in that ecosystem that really fosters that drive? That's an excellent question. So partly there's selection bias, and we have to be intellectually honest and think about that. A bunch of freshmen that want to start startups come to Stanford every year with that goal. But that's only maybe a third of the story. The rest of the story has to do with an enormous ecosystem of clubs, accelerators, classes, and other things that are driving students in that direction. So 95% of Stanford's undergrads that go from freshman to senior year will take a computer science class by the time they leave. Famously, CS106A captures 95% of Stanford students. And if you start from there as your baseline, you're actually doing a lot better than virtually any other school we've talked to. So that's one is you have this technical ability. The second one I would talk about is access. We have events like we had Trevor from Mammoth coming to talk to folks last week. We had Josh Wolf from Lux coming to talk to our cohort the week before that. So when these folks are strutting around campus looking for new opportunities, there's a rep for every kind of venture network. There's partners five minutes away on Sand Hill Road. That was kind of a shock to me. First, I didn't know what Sand Hill Road was. But when I found out about it, sophomore year, the discovery that it was literally five minutes away from the place that I was taking history class really made a lot of things make sense. So you're combining talent that's already interested with incredible access, and then I would say a lot of institutional knowledge. So your professors that may not be teaching startups per se, or they may not be teaching how to code web apps, they may be teaching psychology about how to make products interesting and fulfilling. They may have had you know, the founder of Snapchat in their class and talked to them about early iterations. So there's this whole network of folks that are really there to help you if you want to start a company. And instead of seeing undergrads as somebody that may start a company in 10 or 20 years, they're seeing undergrads as somebody that may start a company tomorrow. And that fix is phenomenal. So the point of your question isn't really descriptive, it's normative. How could we create an ecosystem across Europe and MENA and many other places that would make startups founded by undergrads possible. So there's a few things there. One is access and College Ventures Network is big into this. How can we get folks that are starting companies, not only just in London, which frankly has a pretty good network that's growing, but in Brazil, in China, in many other places, how could we get their undergrad companies a look from VCs that says, I'm gonna take you seriously as a founder and I'm gonna investigate your market and investigate your technology and potentially invest in you. So how could we get them a look? How could we get professors that instead of saying, I only teach psychology, that just means how people interact with each other. How do we get them to say, maybe that means how do we make social apps that bring people together? Or how do we create online experiences that are engaging and fulfilling and fun? So it's a mind shift among professors. And then ultimately, it's going to come down to a mind shift among university administrators. And so the first place when we were going to publish a little study about how we do the College Ventures Network, we didn't necessarily go to a student blog about how students should be doing things. We didn't go to a professor blog about professors and what they should be doing. We went to something called OTT, the Office of Technology Transfer Tactics. And their job is to facilitate transfer of information and technology between universities and from university administrations and faculty down to students. So they were fascinated to know how could we have a network that helps universities help students start companies. How do we get this help chain moving? And what we told them was when somebody comes into your office and shows you an article about the College Ventures Network and says, why don't we have that here? I want to start it. Just say yes. It's actually easy. You know, <laughs> the students know what to do. They know where to get money. They know how to find companies. They know how to start them. But when they ask for permission to set up an organization that supports them to build the rest of that infrastructure we were talking about, the classes, the clubs, the organizations, give them that license. 
it's incredibly powerful. And as I think the Cardinal Ventures example shows it works. Absolutely. And in terms of the College Ventures Network, how have you seen that grow since you founded it? So you have this network. Mm. What exactly are you planning to do in the next five, 10 years with that? If only we knew. So <laughs> the growth has been, has been quite a story. It was not anything we expected. I remember when we started this, it was largely from inbound. We weren't trying to start some kind of network. Basically what it was is there were a few Medium articles that had been written by past presidents of Cardinal Ventures by myself that got some traction on Medium. And folks that were trying to start startup accelerators at their colleges, or they had one that they were trying to take over and up level, would reach out to us and say, you know, how do you do this? We're trying something over here. Maybe it's working, maybe it's not. Let's share notes. So we had a ton of these one-on-one -on -one calls where we were having incredible, insightful conversations, sharing how to get sponsors, how to do curriculum, how to bring in VCs, how to develop good companies. But frankly, the calendar was getting full. We would have maybe 10 or 15 of these a week, and it was feeling ridiculous. So we thought instead of doing these one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, which were amazing, and frankly, siloing them, why don't we bring them together around one table? So we started with just seven schools on a Zoom call, kind of like this one, I guess it's a hop-in call, um, trying to figure out what we all needed from something like the College Ventures Network. And ultimately, the first answer was more of those conversations. How can we keep talking? How can we figure out how to run an accelerator that, as Dina says, actually leverages the value we can all bring and leverages economies of scale, both at the group level at a school, but also the network level to make sure everyone's getting a look and the support they need? And then what can we do from there? So the first thing we did is we listened and we heard from schools across the country in Virginia, in Texas, in Indiana and in Michigan, that unlike Stanford, which happens to be five minutes from Sand Hill Road is this weird perk of geography, their companies just can't get a look. Frankly, it's logistically harder. There isn't the same track record. They don't necessarily have these old contacts or alumni bases. So their companies were graduating from school and they weren't getting any returns to their cold emails to investors. We thought, you know what, maybe we could solve this. What if we brought the buying power of instead of just having 15 companies from each school that may or may not be ready. We could take the best company from every school in the network, which at that time was 15 schools and put them in a demo day. And that would be a compelling offering to investors. And ultimately that demo day had more investors come than the Cardinal Ventures demo day. So we were wow. incredibly excited by that. It seemed like the model In the first was demo day? The very first one. Wow. You could take one company from every school around the world. It was vetted by students who were choosing who was the most likely to be investable, put them on the same stage and maybe investors would come and they did. So that was wonderful. You're connecting Silicon Valley money to global talent, which was always the dream. So the question is what's next? One, it might be a conference like this one. We were so inspired by what adventure is doing. We wanted to bring people together. Two, it's we want to add more schools to this network because if the whole point is community and if you talk about, you know, Metcalf's law, the value to each node on the network increases as the size of the network increases. But lastly, it's about finding more and better companies so that the next time somebody asks the VC, what does investment look like in MENA? What does investment look like in mm -hmm. Europe or in LATAM? They can point to the latest student founder that just raised a unicorn round. That's our goal, that when we're holding Adventure Emerge in 2023 or 2024, and that question gets asked, maybe there are going to be some different answers. That would be fantastic. You mentioned at the beginning that you wanted to come back to how you recommend that students actually start a company mm. if they're in college at the same time. Yeah, it's such a good question. So the first thing I would do, and I'm more than a little bit biased here, is find the resources on your campus. Because there's people sometimes sitting on their hands, sometimes really busy, but they're spending all their time marshalling resources to help student founders. And you might as well raise your hand and say, hey, I'm about to be one of those. Let's talk about all the resources we have at our disposal. Let's see what money we've got, what credits, who we can pull in. If you're interested in a particular space, whether it's travel or biotech or diagnostics or really anything else, who do we know on this campus that could be really valuable? And then start looking for problems that are really impactful for you. There's, there's a myth in venture and Silicon Valley in particular that companies are something that happens to you. You're sitting around minding your own business. You never wanted to start a company, but there was this pressing problem that was so devastating. You couldn't move on until it was solved. And so you became a startup, uh, startup founder. I don't know. I'm not so sure. I, what I've heard from a lot of folks and what most founders will tell you in an honest moment at 
you know, a dinner or at an event or anywhere else is they wanted to be founders. And they knew they wanted to be founders. They couldn't work for somebody else. They knew they wanted to build their own thing from zero to as far as it would go. And then they went and looked for some problems to solve. And they might have been problems in their past or in their present that were gnawing at them. But you can start with that mindset and say, hey, I might not start a company right now. I might not start a company next year. But someday I want to be a startup founder. So I'm going to look around in the world as I move through it and see what's wrong, what's broken, what's exhausting, what's really low tech and hasn't been disrupted in a long time. So we think about a binary often between who's a founder and who's not a founder. The reality is that binary is only broken when you break it. And it doesn't really exist in the present either. So founders started as non-founders. And in that time, they were collecting information that would be helpful once they broke through that barrier. And you can start categorizing yourself that way too. Instead of current student at such and such place or a current person that does this job, you're a future founder that's looking for their idea and you're gonna keep doing whatever you're doing. You're gonna go to class and you're gonna go to your job. But in the meantime, you're looking around and you're keeping note and there might not be a time clock on it or there might be because you're trying to graduate from a program and start something. But just keep track passively of where these ideas are and what's wrong out there and what worked in one vertical and maybe you could apply somewhere else or what vertical needs a specific model you saw from somewhere else. And then when you're ready and when that idea feels mature enough, talk to some people. VCs love to do this. They love to hear ideas because it means they're hearing it before anyone else is. So even if you don't have your fancy deck yet and you're not ready to raise some money, go, go call them up. They could be your local angel that just, you know, sold their whatever business in your town, or it could be a professor, or it could be somebody you meet in Silicon Valley on Twitter. But chat them up and say, I'm thinking about these ideas. How could this be a really valuable company? What would it look like if this were really good? And conversely, what are the risks I'm not thinking about right now and aren't really taken into account in my model? So it's really about socializing the idea. You could say having conversations, talking to people that know some things we don't know and bringing them along for the journey. Because ultimately the people you chat through some ideas with now are gonna be the people that invest or work for you or work with you later. So start meeting those people before you need them. Yeah, that's some great advice, Grant. Um, we have to have one more question. I wanted to ask, what kind of role do you think companies like Cardinal Ventures or College Ventures Network play in mm. ensuring access to the sort of startup world? Because you've acknowledged the, mm. a couple of things. They say that you have the binary of founders and non-founders. And earlier, you also mentioned that we have a little bias of, of the sample that goes to Stanford anyway. Yeah. So if, for example, you come from a, a background where you have the pressure to graduate from, from college and, and work straight away and to make an income during college as well, you don't have that mm. free time to go and build a startup on the side where you're not getting paid. How can we work together to move towards better access for a range of people from different backgrounds? That is really the core question. That's what <laughs> we're working on here. Sorry, <laughs> I give you a heads up on that one. <laughs> no, 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 no. I like it. It's absolutely true. And what I think is important here is one of the things you implied in your question was that folks should just drop everything and start a company when they're feeling it. And that's so far from true. Take whatever job you want to take, start working, build your skills, meet more people and develop your company on the side. And I think there's a tipping point. There's a tipping point when it feels like it's got enough legs that you should be quitting at a certain point, or maybe you're just about to raise money and you know you'll have some economic security. So to folks that are feeling like maybe I don't have the economic security to go start something right now, don't. Wait until you have that job that you're working in and maybe it's not taking all of your power. A lot of my friends in big tech are doing the 20 hour work week and enjoying it. If you can get something along those lines, that's a fantastic base from which to start a company. But this idea that you should be throwing the baby out with the bathwater and maybe catching it on the way down is not right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Let that absolutely. baby grow and, you know, take it for a walk. Yeah, because you've definitely had this perception that it's either all in or nothing. You're not committed mm, if, no. if you're not doing it full time and doing that. It's not realistic for everyone to be able to do that. And I wonder sometimes how many Google, Facebook, Yahoo companies that could have been born on college campuses were stifled yeah. by, by this idea because we do have a huge student debt crisis, but we want to make sure that people don't feel mm. that it's all or nothing scenario. So I think this conversation was really great to open that up to different people. We actually do have time for another question. Maybe. So I'd love to hear more about your, your thoughts on how you start a startup accelerator, because we have participants and mm. attendees from all over the world, and I'm pretty sure there are some college 
college campuses that just don't have those networks or resources or even an accelerator yeah. program. So for people wanting to start one, what does that look like? Let's say they, they don't have experience in VC and startups and they want to do something like this. When we talked earlier about the core functions of the College Ventures Network, I left one out. And one of the core functions of the College Ventures Network was to help people start startup accelerators where they are. We did it, we've all done it at various schools. And the idea is ultimately we wanna productize it because you need a few things for these accelerators. You need some resources that make it valuable. You need investors that are gonna pay attention to you. Then you need companies to go through it and that's pretty core, but companies tend to follow the others. So what we're gonna do, and I think it's gonna come out in a few months is something we're calling Accelerator in a Box. Imagine if I could send you, it'll probably be an email, but imagine if I could send you a box with AWS credits and Stripe credits and HubSpot and legal and accounting that you could just hand over to any company you want to. And imagine we could hand you investor interest and a spot in a demo day that hundreds of investors from Silicon Valley would come to for your companies. And then you could turn around and pitch that to your university and pitch that to all the companies on your campus, pitch that to the engineers that are thinking, maybe I start something, maybe I join something. That would be transformational. And before we do that, in the meantime, feel free to just shoot us an email. We do this all day long. We're working on building out some in the New Jersey area. We're working on building out some in Northern England. We're really working all over the place to do this. So if you want tailored support, definitely reach out to us. This is our bread and butter. And it's frankly why we started this. We didn't start this so the accelerators that already exist in you know, the 20, 30, 40 in the US, in the UK and Canada would have more fun. We did this so that any student anywhere could have the resources they need to start the company they wanna build. That's the goal. And one of the intermediate steps there is that any student anywhere can develop the resources they wish they had. If you're at a campus that doesn't have a startup accelerator, if you don't have a class that teaches you how to incubate a company, let's start one together. That's what we're here for. So shoot us an email and in two months, you'll be looking out for a box from us. I think that's all we have time for today, but definitely everyone check out College Ventures Network. So many exciting mm. things coming up. Looking forward to your conference as well. Thank you, Grant. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Zara. Fantastic.